Hello everyone and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm your host Kim Todd. We're happy you could join us for the next hour of answering your gardening questions. At the present time, we cannot take those phone calls. You can still send us an email with those pictures and questions for future shows. That address is byf at unl.edu. You have to tell us where you're from. Also keep in mind, you can find past shows and features on our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. So of course, we always start the show with samples and Jody, you've made something that is not real pretty on the twig, pretty in your vase. Well, the hort chair always gets to have a pretty vase. So <laughs> I, they're not pretty, but these are uh, bullet galls mm -hmm. and they're from two different oak trees. So oak bullet gall, this is a bur oak, and then these are swite, sw swite, swamp white oak. Um, they're made by a wasp. If you can see them down here, the ones that have holes, uh, wasps have a little, emerged. And these are really tiny wasps, just a couple millimeters. And then the ones that do not have a hole, they will emerge. They are unsightly, so people don't like them on their tree, but they don't do a lot of damage unless there's consecutive years. It may do some stunting. So if you can pick those off or prune them, that might be helpful, but otherwise it's just kind of an ugly thing. It's not really a damaging thing. You know, we did have one of our viewers ask a question about when they pick them off, they leave a little, they take a little bit of the tree with. So I, that may be a little yeah, damaging. Pruning. But, yeah. so, but I found today when I took some of these, they're on the new growth. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's really good mm -hmm. to prune out new growth, if that's where all the, the galls are being formed. But if they emerge from the galls and immediately start laying eggs, then they're gonna keep doing it in that spot. So you kinda of wanna to try to remove what you can. I think for children at home, it's a penny a pick. So, what yeah, do you think? They can earn a lot of pennies this <laughs> spring. <laughs> All right. Bill, it is kind of an interesting, tiny little grass sample. Today. It is grass, yep. <laughs> in the turf chair, talking about grass. Um, Excited to be back this year, and I brought uh, some of my favorite plants, grass. Um, this is tall fescue, and I actually got a couple calls um, this week in emails, and so I thought it'd be good for the show. Um, there's a disease that lawns can get, especially tall fescue, when we have dry, warm conditions that we're kind of seeing, you know, after the cold we had last week with the moisture, called ascochyta leaf blight, and people are wondering, they're seeing this kind of crooking on the top of the leaf, and is this a disease? And the answer is no. This is just the dead leaf that was sitting there exposed all winter long. And then the new leaf started to emerge, and that's green. And so as the grass is growing, we're mowing it off. So when we were talking before the show, we talked about like your roots are showing with your hair. Uh, if you have your hair colored, and you would see the different <laughs> color down at the root because the grass plant is growing from the soil upwards. So this is all just gonna get mowed off, it's not a concern. If you are seeing some weird green up, it could be a result of things like grub damage and feeding last year that compromised roots and had those grasses going weak into the winter. That was one of the samples I saw this week. And another was just weird differential heating. You know, near a fence is a little bit warmer than an exposed area or with water might have ran off differently. And so it's just natural green up. It's never very uniform. Uh, if you're continuing to see those areas though that aren't greening up, then we might consider getting some seed in there if it's just like that area is dead because maybe it had some damage in the fall. And then we're fall seeding, we want to get that in right away now and then use a starter fertilizer with that mesotrione weed, uh, weed uh, killer uh, herbicide in it. All right, so would this have been early to see Ascochyta leaf blight? Yeah, it's not quite there yet, and, uh, and so I'm not really quite worried about that yet. Generally, we'd see that in late May to June, um, and, uh, and you know, a diagnosis um, would be very similar to this, but I just wouldn't expect to see that right now. All right, thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's not pretty in the hort chair, so <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I actually kind of have uh, an insect one, but I had to bring this because we have classy bagworms in Platte County. This is actually a bagworm from last year, and if you look at it closely, it's decorated with um, the blue cones of junipers, which this was an eastern red cedar, but eastern red cedar is a juniper. So classy bagworms in Platte County. So those are actually the, the female cones. People call them berries. They're not a berry, they are a female cone. And they're usually fairly bright blue. So that's the female cone or seed. And I kind of wanted to point out uh, the browning in 
this is a branch of eastern red cedar. And if you look really close, um, there is a lot of browning in there. But those are the pollen, pollen structures, pollen producing structures, or what we call male cones of the junipers. And I brought this in because um, I will get questions this time of year from people saying that my junipers are turning brown, my eastern red cedar shelter belt's turning brown, what's wrong, what's going on? And if it's this time of the year, I always make sure they've gotten up close and personal with their plant. Uh, and you should always do that. If you think there's something wrong with your plant, get up close and personal with it and see what's really, try to see what's really going on or the symptoms or signs. Um, you might find that it's just something natural, like on, in this case. But before you call the extension office, it's always a good idea, or email Backyard Farmer. I always tell people, get up close and personal with your plants, really kind of look at what's going on, get a good description, because we're going to ask you a lot of questions uh, to help make that diagnosis. All and right. it may just be something natural. Right, and naturally one of those things that makes your nose run and your eyes itch too. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily not for me. But. Exactly. All right, so picture questions first, Jody. You have a couple that um, these, these viewers have been very patient to have you look at these. Mm -hmm. The first is actually a uh, lilac, and he sent in the pictures here of what he says is really uh, bumps and lumps and, and all over the trunks, and he's wondering what in the world this is and what to do about it. So that's, those first two are on lilac. And I think your, your third picture is on a maple from a different viewer, kind of up, mm -hmm. the, up the trunk and maybe on some of the branches on this one. So what are, we, yeah. uh, what are we looking at and what do we do? So these are scale insects. And thank you for these pictures. They're up close and personal with their, their trees. <laughs> and they're called oyster shell scales. And if you look closely, because they're bumpy and lumpy, they do look like an oyster shell. But there's quite a few on each of those trees. And so that's a hard, they call them hard scales. So they don't produce honeydew, but they will cover the branches and they will make the tree pretty thick. So what you can do to treat this, it, there's a really narrow window. So we're looking for the crawler stage. So these lazy scales are kind of immobile. But once a year, they have like eggs hatch. And so you can see them. Um, the best way to monitor for that is put out like double-sided tape. And then you can find these little pale crawlers on them. And then you know that's when to treat. And you can use any type of contact insecticide. So you can use horticulture oil. You can use insecticidal soap. You can use conventional pesticides as well. Just keep in mind that those are broad spectrum. So they're not as, as gentle. Um, but you can scrub some of the layers off if there's a lot of scales, or you can prune out um, some of those to remove some of those population. But if you can get them during that crawler stage, that's the time to control. And if you're looking for something systemic, um, anything with the active ingredient dy dinotefuran may help, but I don't know if that's available um, to, homeowners. to homeowners, so you may have to call Arborist. Right, so are these going to go all the way up the top of that um, tree. They're pretty much going to yeah. cover uh, the tree and so it's going to be May so it's going to be coming up soon to start looking for those crawlers so put that tape out and try to catch them. It's all about timing. All right thanks and, and they really do look like oysters. Yeah Little they do. Oysters. Too bad they're not edible for people who like oysters. Yeah. All right <laughs> you don't like oysters no. <laughs> Ooh, oysters are good. <laughs> all right uh, Bill this is actually two different viewers. Mm -hmm sent in the same, really the same question at about the same time. Um, the first one here said, one morning it frosted when he walked across his lawn. The turf turned brown where he stepped on it. He hadn't walked in any herbicide. Um, the other one is essentially the same thing. She is from Council Bluffs, and then we have this third one. So what were those what, what are the first two? So the first two, any golfer probably knows what that is. Mm -hmm. That is frost damage. So when you have frost, and frost actually forms right when the sun usually is starting to come up. That's the coldest part of the day. And so frost mm -hmm. starts to form then, and then it forms this, this ice around the leaf. And when you step on it, it shatters, and it's like little pieces of glass getting jammed into those leaves, and it kills all the cells. So mm -hmm. it, it is, it, it's, it's killing all of those leaves. Fortunately, it usually doesn't kill the the crown, the growing point, because that's down in the soil where it's warm, and so that's generally not a problem. So we want to avoid walking on frosted grass just because it damages the leaf. 
again, generally isn't, isn't lethal, but it is unsightly. And this is why golf courses say you can't play until the frost is off because uh, it can you know, cause this kind of damage to the, uh, the turf. That said, in, like, in Japan, they just play right through it because they want to get so many golfers through. They just keep playing. That third image is snow mold. And you might really? think this is weird, you know, why are we seeing snow mold? But snow mold actually is active um, when there's a lot of moisture and the temperature range is about 35 degrees Fahrenheit to about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you remember two weeks ago, we were cold and wet and we had all that snow. And so we had prime conditions and we had some succulent green growth from the heat we had earlier in the month. And so we had green grass. I think the, the uh, viewer said that they had some fertility going down. High fertility nitrogen fertilizer will also stimulate that disease. And so you went into that frost and that snow and we had snow mold. Not a thing to worry about. It's getting warm. The pathogen is not active anymore. You can't spray for it. It's already going dormant and you'll just mow that off. Well, and he actually said he mowed and then it snowed. Yep. And he was in Council Bluffs also. So we had walking on the yeah, and frozen turf and snow if you mold. mow like um, some exudates, some sugar rich uh, moisture can come up and that can further feed those pathogens so that uh, they can really grow. So we had a prime conditions if you had a you know, green succulent grass underneath that snow. All right, perfect. All right, Kelly, um, you have some tree issues. Okay. <laughs> Imagine that in the Hort chair. Mm -hmm. um, the first one here is a, a viewer who has watched us since the 60s, so we have Great. to give them a shout out for that. This is in Papillion. Uh, it's a birch, 15 years old, mm -hmm. 30 feet tall, twin trunk. She is saying twin, and I guess we were talking off air, Kelly, that there's mm -hmm. kind of a double on the yep, right I there. Uh, leaves are not as uh, lush as they are on the single trunk. She's wondering what they mm -hmm. can do to help it flourish, and she is asking, is this a white birch? Okay. Yes, it is a white birch. And I guess the first thing I, I'm wondering is when that raised bed area was put around it. If that was put on there after the plant had been planted and the tree was established, then that's enough to cause that tree to start to decline. Um, we never wanna raise the grade even as much as two to three inches over the and established roots of the trees and then just that moisture up against the trunk. Um, that could be what's causing the, tr the tree to start to decline and become thinner as well. If the tree was planted after that was there, just know that white birch does not like Nebraska's hot summers, so they do tend to be stressed, even if we give them quite a bit of water. Um, it looks fine. I, I guess they could watch the trunk for D-shaped holes because they are susceptible to a bronze birch borer, um, but you would see signs of that on the trunk itself. So I'm going to guess that it's the, the raised bed that was put up around it and is causing it to decline, and there really isn't much you can do at this point, but wait and probably watch it decline slowly. And hope they have a fireplace when they have to take it out. Right. Put those logs outside the fireplace. Mm -hmm. Typically that 30 foot height is about when we see the borers. Start in, start on them. And then your, your next one is, uh, this is Elm Creek, Nebraska. And this is a Reliance peach, about mm -hmm. eight to 10 years old. It's had the crack in the trunk for about three years. The crack seeps, is mm -hmm. this a former peach? A former peach. <laughs> it probably will be pretty soon. Um, you know, the first thing I notice is there's, it looks like there's four trunks that were allowed to develop in one spot, and maybe they kind of have some, uh, a weak crotch area, we call it, or a weak attachment. And whenever you allow four trunks to form in one place, as they're growing, they're getting bigger in diameter and providing pressure, so it's possible that that caused that crack to start. And then once you get a crack started like that, you can get moisture in there. Peach are very susceptible to a couple of different canker diseases. So, and once you get a wound like that, then you're more likely to potentially get a canker disease in there. Um, it, it's hard to say exactly what happened, but in the, if you lose this tree and you get another one, try to have a single trunk um, and <laughs> right. hope for the best. Peach and is not really a long-lived tree in Nebraska. Um, but you want to take care of it as well as you can, or it can get a canker and die back, but there really isn't anything you can do. All right, thanks, Kelly. Well, you know, every spring we get plenty of turf questions dealing with pre-emergence, fertilization issues. If you'd rather have somebody else deal with it, you can always hire a lawn service to take care of your turf. Let's take a few minutes to hear from Bill about making an informed decision on the right lawn service company. It can be a little bit of work 
to have that nice looking lawn. And for some people, we don't want to put the time and the effort or have the expertise required to make their lawn looking as good as they would like. So in those situations, a lawn care service is a great alternative. There are a couple things you want to think about when it comes to selecting a lawn care service. One, we want to make sure that they're uh, certified pesticide applicators with the state of Nebraska. Nebraska, like all states, requires that applicators at a lawn care service that are making pesticide applications for hire are certified. If your lawn care service only does mowing and fertility, however, they may not need to be certified. So those are some of the things you'd want to ask on that first call. Another thing you want to think about when selecting a lawn care service is to figure out you know, the education and training of the members of that service. Here at the University of Nebraska, we train students to become turf grass professionals in various uh, areas of turf grass management. And so you want to see, you know, what kind of education does that lawn care service uh, have and experience? And then what continuing education do they have? Are they a member of our ne Nebraska Turf Grass Association? Are they coming to uh, research and field days? These are kind of events that help keep our lawn care services up to date. And so we encourage them to come and, and ask them about what they're doing to continually educate themselves to be true professionals. Another thing we want to look for is are they insured and are they responsive to you? So you know, it's, it's, a, it's an actual company that can go out, uh, if they make a mistake, they have that insurance, and uh, if you have a problem, you can call them and get a, an immediate amount of feedback. And so that's the thing that you really want to think about. Another benefit about lawn care companies for all uh, homeowners are they can have access to different products and uh, fertilizers that homeowners might not have access to. And so if you have a particular weed like we talk about on Backyard Farmer that is really difficult to control, there may be some alternatives in control that a lawn care company can use that a homeowner may not, may not have access to from a garden center, nursery, or big box store. And so there can be advantages too to, uh, to figuring out what you want to do. Another thing you can think about with lawn care companies is what kind of service do you need? Do you want mowing and trimming or do you want just you know fertility and, and pest weed control? And even some other disease control, those can be add-ons. And so when it comes to selecting that lawn care company, one, do some research, get referrals, ask around, ask for references, and look for reviews to try to figure out you know, who are really those professionals that are gonna provide the service that you'd require. You know, and always a little research goes a long ways to getting any professional to look at anything, including that turf. So there's no need wasting your money on those scammers. Thanks very much, Bill. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of hard sometimes to tell who those scammers are. So, all right, this is, I guess it's way cool because we've not seen it, you said, in your four years, Jody. Mm -hmm. uh, this is in Garland, Nebraska. It's a dwarf Norway spruce. He says there appear to be little green worms that are turning the needles brown, producing webbing. And uh, he wants to know if, uh, what to do about this. And that's great to put that penny yeah. in there for scale. And yeah, I haven't seen this, but I was talking to our horticulturist today and he has had calls about this. So this is the spruce needle miner. And it's a, a moth. This is the larvae or the caterpillar that's uh, gonna feed on the the spruce leaves and it creates this like matting and so what you can do is try to break that up I don't know how thick it is it's not bagworm thick so you may be able to spray it with like the the hose of with water or you can take a rake and try to rake those up um, you can use you know BT uh, for the feeding caterpillars if you can get to them um, and, and get to the spruce needles spray them so they can, they can eat them and, and die. Otherwise, um, there is acephate. It's a little bit, you know, more broad spectrum, but that should take care of it because they may be pretty hardy when they're in those feeding mats. But um, it can do damage to the, the tops of the spruce tree. So that's something you want to keep in mind. So uh, I think they are going to turn into moths at late May. So right now they're feeding, so they're active. So, you know, good timing. hopefully that works. And this is a dwarf, so at least it's a little one. What's a BT? I mean, is there like a timing or make, make that more successful okay, so in other ways of doing so it's, it? So it's, it's BTK, so that's the bacillus for uh, caterpillars, very, you know, targeted to the caterpillar. And so it's like a dose, right? So the smaller they are, the more effective it's going to be because they don't have to eat as much. So you want to do it when they're little. So right now while they're feeding. And so with, you know, bagworms, it's when they're teeny tiny, then you don't need a lot, right? 
Mm -hmm. And that did look like a bagworm initially. Yeah. So it, I'm glad he sent that other picture. Yeah. yeah. So. All right. Thanks, Jody. And then um, you had another picture too oh. that's really fun. And this is <laughs> like yeah, more. you're not oh. off. You're not oh, off the hook yes. yet. <clears throat> this is Council Bluffs again. Uh, she's had this on flower pots and trash can lids. Is it a bug nest, insect egg? She started seeing these Ooh, in the fall. Okay. So there's nothing to worry about here. There, it's kind of like a little tiny stingless wasp nursery. So it, uh, it's made by a potter wasp or a mason wasp. They use mud, they make these little pots like ceramic. If you see a hole like that, it means like a little tiny wasp emerged. Um, the female does make that and then she puts like caterpillar pieces in, lays an egg. So. Wasp nursery, nothing to worry about. You can scrape those off. Um, they just lay, the, they just make those everywhere. They're just really cool. They're just potters. They're yeah, just cute. they're cute. <laughs> All right, Bill, this is a gearing okay. viewer. So yep. thanks, shout out to our panhandle viewers. Uh, she says this is on the north side of the house where the snow banks, there's new green growth coming up through it. Wondering if she should be concerned and it, uh, I asked the question about whether that is a downspout on that first picture, but this, she does say there's new coming up through it, but it, it appears as though that downspout is dumping right on it. So yeah, and, and this again would be that snow mold. Again, normally we don't call it snow mold anymore. We call it microdochium patch or microdochium instead of snow mold or pink snow mold because people think you have to have snow and all you need to have is a lot of moisture in cool weather with green succulent growth. And so, um, don't, I wouldn't worry about it as we start to kind of grow out of it. The season's over, there's no need to treat. Um, and you'll see that green grass growing up underneath, so you'll just mow that off. And um, if you can, if there's a downspot there, try to get that moisture away from those areas so that when we have these cool and wet uh, weather, that we minimize the, the risk. So that's the best thing that we can really do to try to minimize the, the, that pink snow mold. All right, and then you have another one, and this is the other side of the state. Uh, this is a viewer, uh, Omaha Memorial Park area. He says about the end of June, he notices this spot, same location every year. He thought a, near, a sprinkler head wasn't hitting it. He's overseeded. This is this year, so he just sent this picture so you can see last year what it does and this year what it looks like this week. Yeah, it's hard to say. Um, it could be some kind of a soil issue. Uh, I see it next to a, a, um, your driveway or your, your walk path there. Is it, is it compaction? Um, is it salt issues from, from road, uh, salt in the winter time? Um, so it'd be really hard to know just from that picture. It just looks like thin turf. And if you don't see response to fertilizer, uh, then it probably is some kind of compaction. You can't fertilize your way out of compaction issues. So if it's, mm -hmm. if it's compacted or if it's a sodium issue from, from uh, winter salt applications, um, and you don't see a fertilizer response, you know, try to stick a screwdriver in there, if it's hard as a rock or um, if you take a sample and it's just, there's no structure or crumbliness to the soil, those would be indications that you can maybe do a soil test or have someone come in to try to airify that area to try to loosen up that soil, let that, that grass uh, succeed there. All right, thanks, Bill. Okay, you have a, a little bit of winter issue going on okay. here, I, I'm afraid, yeah. uh, Kelly. Your first one here is mature ewes. These are 25 years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're yellowing, then browning. Started just two weeks ago. She's wondering, cedar wood chips, is this a nitrogen deficiency? Is it too much sun? Can she renovate? What can she do here? Okay, well, being 25 years old, they've obviously been happy mm -hmm. up to this point. So you'd mentioned a winter issue. There could be some winter desiccation. The other possibility is if it, when, they, when they turn yellow first and then they turn brown, sometimes it's a root-related issue. Um, you know, so. We can't see the roots. I always say I wish I could x-ray the tree or x-ray the roots, then, we, then I can give you a better idea than an educated guess. But if, you know, if they're 25 years old, um, another possibility would be armillaria root rot. I feel like I'm getting into Kyle's area. Um, but they were around in 2012 when it was really hot and dry and heat stressed and maybe they got infected then with armillaria root rot and possibly it, took the, it would take this long before you actually start seeing decline and dieback. Um, you, with our malaria, you might see golden honey-colored mushrooms down at the base, but you might not. So either way, if it's as severe as it is, if it is winter, dieback winter desiccation, um, it looks pretty severe. If it's the armillaria root rot, they're dead too. 
So uh, with winter desiccation, we do sometimes tell people to wait till about June 1st to see if you get any new growth from if the buds survived, but that looks like pretty extensive damage to me. So I would be surprised if it would recover. All right, and then you've got boxwood oh, in okay. Omaha. Ooh. So this is Midtown, South Exposure. Uh, these were transplanted. The ones, the far right one died. This is the third one there in this photo. It was a dry creek bed. So there's some issues. She's right. wondering what can she, can she promote the health or should she give up? And we see a hose and a downspout on that one too, right, I think. Right, and so boxwood is one of our broadleaf evergreens. And the information will say that it likes, it'll grow in full sun, but it really prefers um, dappled shade or filtered shade. And the south exposure right up against a white house where you get a lot of reflection, um, you know, it, these are going to struggle just in that site. So it's kind of a wrong plant for that location. I, I, I'm wondering if the one on the right that's brown and dyed, I mean, it's right there by a downspout. So in boxwood is very susceptible to root rots as well. So that could have been a case, especially with all the moisture and rain we've had the last few years that it was just too wet of a soil. And again, another root rot maybe settled in. So ideally, I think you're gonna struggle with these plants uh, as long as they're in that exposure. So there are definitely better choices. Um, so in the long run, you'd probably be better off replacing them. All right, and you have a third one, and okay. this is Seward. Okay. <laughs> and this is Manhattan Euonymus, which is also a broadleaf evergreen. And his real question is, he's seeing some green buds okay. still on some of those, mm -hmm. the branches that look dead. Should he just go ahead and wait until they leaf out? Well, like I said, with the, the use, we, if you have, if it is, wait till June 1st, if you want to, as bare as they are. Um, or the other thing you can do is scrape that bare twig with your thumbnail. And if it's green underneath there, then definitely wait a little while and see if you get any budding or leafing out. Um, if it's dry and brown and brittle, then they're gone and you might as well prune them off. And again, that's not a great location for a broadleaf evergreen, just right against the cement and right surrounded by gravel. It's probably going to be a plant that will struggle. All right, thanks, Kelly. Well, we have finally had some glorious days, and that means getting our garden prepped, ready for planting. Here to tell us more is Terry James from the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, I'm gonna talk about kind of our outdoor prep. Our plants are indoors, they're getting ready, they're growing. These great sunny days have actually been excellent for them, so they're looking really, really good. But we're gonna move outside. We're gonna make sure that all of our weeds are getting under control. As you can see, we have lots of dandelions coming kind of up in our, our pathway. We're just gonna use a fork to get those out, no chemicals. We're gonna edge all of our beds. We do use two types of soil. We use the ground soil, which every fall we amend with compost. But when we work in our containers, we actually use a soilless mix specifically for containers. So that's a much lighter mix, actually holds the water much better. So we're gonna make sure all those are cleaned out, get rid of all the debris from last fall, and we're gonna start filling those in and putting our flowers in there. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check out what we're doing. And of course, our turf guy had to comment on the few dandelions that <laughs> popped out of the ground. We did get some potting mixture in those containers. In the weeks to come, we should be getting those plants in the ground. Right now, it is time for the lightning round. Are you ready for your first lightning of the year, I'm, Kelly? I'm ready. Yep, the first one of the year. <laughs> All right. This is a viewer who said uh, she planted her onion sets before that record cold snap. She's wondering, is she going to need to replant them? Time will tell. So, <laughs> I mean, look at them, and if they look damaged, then replant. If they don't look damaged, then hopefully they'll be okay. All right. So we've had several questions this week also about freeze damage. Uh, this is a viewer who said hostas, daylilies, tiger lilies all look pretty tough. Should that foliage be removed? Uh, you could, if the, if the foliage is really bad, you could remove the foliage that's the most damaged, but try not to remove too much. If it's half damaged, maybe leave it for a while to help the plant. All right, this is an Albion viewer who wonders whether Epsom salts are the best fertilizer for hostas. No, only if you have a magnesium deficiency in the soil and the only way to know that would be to have a soil test, but that's pretty rare. All right, this is an Ashland viewer who wants to know 
if anything, will kill small cedars. <laughs> Clip them off at ground level, they won't grow back. All right, uh, this is a viewer from Claytonia who says there aren't many seeds on the ash or the maple this year, is that unusual? Um, this year, well, they could have frozen. I mean, the flowers could have frozen because they bloom fairly early. Sometimes they were blooming in February and, and sometimes in March, so they probably got frosted and there won't be. All right, excellent, nice job. You ready? It yeah. is lightning round. <laughs> uh, I'll be fast. <laughs> okay. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, Bill, your first question is from a viewer who wants to know how long you have to wait before seeding after you spray Roundup. Uh, just a couple days. It's a fully absorbed product, so it won't stick in the soil. All right. This is a Cedar Bluffs viewer who wants to uh, stop mowing her lawn, so she's wondering how tall how tall do bluegrass and fescue get if they're not mowed? Uh, they'll get about a foot and a half. In uh, the first year, they're going to look ugly, and then they'll kind of naturally start to thin out, but you're still going to have to mow maybe like once or twice a year just to get that off of there, so... Uh, yeah, about yay high. <laughs> right. And 12 inches is what their community allows. So. Mm, yeah, that's going to be a problem. This is a viewer uh, who has, this is an Omaha viewer, has full shade turf under mature burr oaks. And he's wondering, is there a turf species that will handle that? No, it's just like growing full sun flowers in the shade. It just doesn't work. If you can't grow tall fescue in the shade, you can't grow anything in the shade as a grass. Put some ground cover there. All right. This is a Cheyenne, Wyoming viewer who wants to know how long can you store bagged fertilizer? As long as it doesn't get all clumpy and wet, it should be fine. Nice. Yep. Good job. Okay, Jody. Ready? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm going to make faces at you. Okay. <laughs> okay uh, this is a Nebraska City viewer who wonders when to expect those clover mites. Oh, every day. It's like the story of my life right now. So uh, if you don't have them, just be grateful. Okay. There's a Hebron viewer who says uh, he's seen one giant bumblebee. Oh, yeah. All day long around his house. What What's going on? Oh, so that it's a, a queen bumblebee. It back to its foraging, looking for some pollen, and then it's going to start a nest. All right, this is a viewer who uh, says their neighbor feeds all sorts of animals, chickens and squirrels and things, and mm -hmm. wondering what she can do to protect her own dogs from the ticks that might come into the lawn from those animals. Okay, so there's probably not a lot you can do to protect the, the, from them from coming in, but you can have your dog treated um, you know, recommendations from a veterinarian, fleas and ticks, and then just check your dog every time it comes in. All right. When would sh should we be on the lookout for carpenter bees? Uh, right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they are out. In other words, it is. They are out. It, it's, it's buggy out there. It's buggy. Out. I, yes, I've received yeah. carpenter bee calls today. Oh boy. Yeah. All right. Good timing on our part. Yes. All right, Kelly, what do we have today? Okay, what we have here are some beautiful flowers. So well, one's a shrub and one's a, a weed. No, <laughs> or a wildflower. Um, the pink blooming one, the pink blooming one is a double uh, flowering almond. Okay, and double because uh, the blossom obviously is a double. And this is a fairly good sized shrub um, that blooms very early as you can see, but uh, I think it's from is it from Kim's yard? No. Nope. Nope. nope, it's not from Kim's no. yard. But it is from Lincoln, and so it, it didn't, it didn't, uh, it wasn't damaged by the frost. No. So that's good because it is an early flowering one. And these are, you know, a nice shrub, but they're going to be somewhat short lived. But they are beautiful when they bloom. So, and the purple and the white, okay, that's wild violet. And some people view this as a beautiful wildflower, and some people view it as a weed in their yard. So it will spread. Um, if you let it grow, it'll form a nice ground cover, kind of a nice mat. Um, and I can attest to that because it has done that in a portion of my yard where I just kind of let it go. Um, and I kind of debated whether I should have, especially with all the moisture the last few years, that's been really good growing conditions for it. So, but a beautiful, beautiful bloomer early in the spring and a nice ground cover. Excellent, good. thank you. And by the way, the violets <laughs> are from what passes for my lawn, Bill. It's beautiful. You must have a gorgeous lawn. A lot of shade. I do. It looks See, like that. You can't grow grass in the shade. You could grow that. You exactly. got that right. Exactly. <laughs> okay, Jody. Uh, we have Grub World coming up in your pictures. Yeah. The first one is uh, they're in Lincoln. Cleaned out the compost. Found these. Um, 
they did say mm -hmm. something probably ate them, but what are those in the compost? Yeah, so that's a type of white grub. They'll turn into a scarab beetle, likely the May, June beetle. They don't know when they're supposed to show up. They could be April, May, and June beetles, right? They could show up early, mm -hmm. but uh, you can pick them out like that and feed them to the birds. They would love it. <laughs> okay, and they stay out of your lawn that way. Yeah. They do. All right, this is a Sac City, Iowa viewer and found this abundance of grubs when tilling the garden. Okay. What are those? Yep, so those are also white grubs. Uh, they could be the May, June beetle as well. Uh, so they're pretty much mature larvae. But if you've got 40 or however many, it depends. Like if you've got a square foot area and you've got more than 10, you may want to order some beneficial nematodes if, if that is what, if you want to get rid of them. But if you found 40 in a really large space, it may not be a problem. There isn't anything labeled for like the garden. If they have a problem with the turf, then that's something else. Yep. All right, and you've got yet another, and this is Elgin, Nebraska. Um, they, they took down an ash mid-October. They found these uh, brilliant colored one and a half to two inch. Yeah, so I didn't know that the carpenter worm was this beautiful because they're usually in the wood. You don't see them. <laughs> but the carpenter worm is actually a caterpillar. And so as an adult, it's a moth, but it's a wood boring organism. And so it only really does damage to unhealthy ash trees. So if they took it down in October, it was probably unhealthy and damaged. And if they want to protect other ash trees that are there from native boars, because this is a native uh, boar, where, where are they from? Elgin. Elgin. So mm -hmm. um, you would just, the best thing to do is keep your tree healthy. So the watering and mulching, and that will be the best form of defense against native boars for your ash trees that you have. Excellent. Thanks, Jody. Okay. No, you can't answer the grub question. I have questions about <laughs> moths and colorful moths. Do you ever get colorful moths? Are they always like brown oh. and gray? And... Yeah, well, mo the majority it's like, I got a brown moth. That's yeah. boring. But sometimes there are some big, beautiful moths. I need to see some big, beautiful moths, I think. Not okay, I'll your send you some. big, ugly grubs. You're yeah. <laughs> okay, Sorry, Bill. Sorry, digress here. Right. So you have actually two questions, again, from two different viewers. Uh, we do not know where one is, but one is Columbus, Kelly. Okay. So this first one, we're not sure where, but this moss started in a cool, moist area, seems to spread by spores faster than she can get rid of it. Uh, need to use something like Roundup. And the second one is, I have this moss-looking stuff growing in my garden. How can I kill it? And this is Columbus. It's kind of funny. So uh, at Cornell, they had a moss garden of different mosses and shapes, and it was really neat. Um, this is moth. It, moss. It is spread by uh, <laughs> moth. Spread by spores. So she's correct. And actually, um, it, some of these can be pretty rare uh, moss. Like the moss on putting greens is really rare, except for on putting greens. Um, and generally, it's found when you have open cover like this, uh, wet conditions, and it, it's pretty ubiquitous in the air. So the spores are all over the place, and they're just looking for that right niche. And then when it's there, it's hard to control. Um, some of the herbicides uh, can work. You can look at the label and see if it will work. I know things that we use sometimes, um, uh, it kills the green foliage, I guess, on the top of the, the moss, but it doesn't really kill it. There's just extremely resilient organism. And so it can be really difficult to control this besides shading it out with a dense turf canopy or if you have to actually physically remove it or try to take it out that way. Um, that's the, really the best way to kind of get rid of these, these particularly uh, uh, troublesome pests. Yeah. All right, and then you have a third picture that I think we said this is a pretty simple. Yeah, we think it's just penny crest, field of penny crest. Yeah. Um, it's a winter annual. Um, it's going to be dying soon with the heat, so nothing to really worry about. Um, uh, it would have germinated last fall over winter, made it seed, spread seeds. It looks like already based on the size of that, and so just mow that off or pull it, and uh, it's going to be dead here soon, anyways. All right, thanks, Bill. This is a viewer, Kelly, who wants to know what these uh, unwanted woody plants are that popped up all over the two acres of former ag fields in Cass County. Okay. So we have a couple pictures that uh, we're sure about, I think. Okay. So this one that we're looking at right now is uh, looks like choke cherry, um, mm -hmm. based on the leaves and then just the buds. The close when I looked at close up of the buds, uh, kind of the coloration of the bud. Same with this one. This one looks like a choke cherry as well, and you know, that's 
a good one to have. I mean, they will spread some, but it's really not considered an invasive and it blooms and good for the pollinators and early in the spring. So, but it will spread. Um, yeah. So if it's on two acres and you're out in the acreage, you're probably gonna see some of these things coming up. And that third so, one. Third one, uh, the foliage uh, is, has not unfurled enough. I could not tell what this is. So if you send another picture in a week or two uh, with, with more foliage on it, um, the only thing I can tell on this is it's an opposite leaved shrub. Exactly. <laughs> send in another picture when the leaves are further along. All right, thanks Kelly. Well, you know, here on Backyard Farmer, we occasionally make recommendations for using chemical pesticides to control those diseases and insects. It can be really confusing when you go to the garden center to buy something. You can't figure out which product to choose because of such similar brand names. Here to help us figure out that problem is our very own Jody Green. talk about the pesticide label and the importance of reading it. I know it can be frustrating going through all the small reading and the fine print and the booklets, but I can guarantee you there are some golden nuggets in there that will help you minimize the risks and maximize the benefits. The first step is to identify the pest. Is it a weed? Is it a fungus? Is it an animal or is it an insect? It's very important to determine the pest before you buy any product. Second, consider an integrated approach to pest management. Is there a way you can trap or monitor those pests so you can remove them from your home or garden? Or can you improve sanitation to reduce the populations? You may also be able to modify the environment so that it makes the situation less favorable for pests. Third, there are many products available on the market and you need to choose the right product for the specific pest in that specific location. You can't assume that all products are going to work for all pests in every situation. For example, these two products, the brand name is Seven. One's a dust and one's a liquid concentration. They may work for the same insect, but they do have different active ingredients and it's important to read the label. The active ingredient in the Seven dust is carbaryl and the active ingredient in the liquid concentration is a synthetic pyrethroid that must be mixed with water in a sprayer. So depending on the pest and the site and how you want to use it, and you can only discover that by reading the label. Another example are the products that have the active ingredient bifenthrin. Bifenthrin can be found in many products. It can be found in a liquid concentrate, it can be found in a ready to use spray with a sprayer already attached, or it can be used as granulars. So knowing where you want to treat, if this is a lawn or a garden or a sprayer on your house, will determine the product. And you can only find that out by reading the label. Let's read the label and focus on the active ingredient statement. The active ingredient is part of the pesticide that is effective against the pest, meaning it's used to kill, control, or repel the pest. A single active ingredient may be found in hundreds of pesticide products with different brand names used for marketing purposes. The same active ingredient may be found in various formulations, so keep that in mind. Some active ingredients will work on a broad spectrum of pests and others will be more targeted per, for a specific pest. And it's also important to know that more of the product or higher concentration isn't always better. All you need to do is read the label. It will tell you the most effective way to apply it to control the pest you want to control and it's the law. It might take you more than a few minutes reading that label before you purchase anything at the garden center, but that's always the best way to get that right product. And remember, follow those instructions because that label is the law. All right, we're gonna kind of roll through these. Uh, Jody, these are all from Shadron. Okay. She's wondering how to keep these insects out of her uh, plants in the basement under her shop lights. They're destroying the tomatoes and the peppers. She's got black flies. She's got little white things. She's got plant lice. She's got leaves falling off. She's used some garden safe and some insecticidal soaps. And this is shadron. Okay, and so shadron inside uh, vegetables. Okay, so the little flies on the yellow sticky thing, I think those are fungus gnats. Those are flies that breed in uh, like wet, super wet, like potting soil. So you can dry out the soil. It's good that you're catching the adults on the glue board. 
um, the other stuff, uh, white flies and aphids on the plants. Uh, I would keep up with the, the, the soap and horticultural oil, but I would just do that, like you don't wanna do too much, but you wanna do it all at the same time so you can get all of them. All right, and then you have one more that's a weird worm one that just okay. sort of... <laughs> Yeah, so these are millipedes. Uh, there are two types of like homes, ones that never see millipedes and ones that see hundreds. And so if you see these, you just wanna keep them out. So make sure you've got you know exclusion, gaps under doors, but they usually are gonna be in the shade. They're decomposers. Uh, I wouldn't use any insecticides because they die anyway. So what, spend your energy just cleaning them up every day, raking them. Okay. Sorry, that's, that that's your a better... house is one they like. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is a turf war question, Bill. Uh -huh. This is Malmo, Nebraska, has brome grass, wonders if the RTF fescue will choke out the brome or will he need to uh, use a herbicide, which he does not want to do. Yeah, the, the, you know, the RTF fescues do have little rhizomes that allow them to kind of grow, but the brome grass is you know, really rhizomatous it's, and it's a lot more aggressive. So what you want to do is try to manage the, the tall fescue uh, in a way to try to encourage it. Uh, so keep it on the drier side. Um, just be a little bit careful with that. But I, I think that the uh, brome grass is probably going to win if you're seeing it kind of moving into it. All right. And your second one here is uh, wondering whether pulling this particular grass by hand will be effective if he doesn't get all the underground runners. And he's wondering, is there a herbicide he could use? It's in a, a bed of uh, broadleaf, ever, uh, broadleaf uh, ground covers. <clears throat> Shoot, I missed that. Um, I just like brome. I think it's brome, and I just I think it's the same situation. Sorry, um, it's so it's gonna have those rhizome stems there. You just pull it, it's just gonna keep on coming back. So if it's in a bed, I would probably need to look at some systemic, like a Roundup, to really try to kill that grass all the way back down to the crown and maybe even spread to some of the daughter plants. So. All right, and then we have another one in Kearney. This is about an inch and a half tall and wide and it grows really mat-like. Yeah, I'm having a really hard time seeing the pictures today. Well, that's kind of a, it's, it's a little hard picture. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to say. Um, it, you don't think it's the annual bluegrass. Um, it could be, it's one of the grasses, the annual bluegrass is a, another winter annual that is a short, dense grass like that. It's a one we deal with all the time. Uh, it can just be pulled out, um, especially in a lawn situation. And if you mow high, if you mow over two inches, this grass can't compete. If generally, you're going to see it on golf course fairways and greens where it's mowed real short. So uh, that's what I think that is um, from that picture. And uh, if you can pull it out, that'd be great. Otherwise, mo raise your mowing height, and that should really help eliminate the annual bluegrass. It starts to grow really vigorously this time of year. And if you pull it, it's not going to come. Yeah, out. there's no rhizomes yeah. there. So you'll right. just hopefully fill in with some of your desirable grasses. All right. Kelly, we have uh, some maples again. Mm -hmm. This is um, three miles south of Holdridge. It's mm -hmm. 15 years old. It is a silver maple. She's wondering, what is this and what should she do? And I think we have a couple pictures of what's going on. Okay, so it looks like the base is falling off, um, yeah. or the bark is falling off of the base. Um, yeah, and that's, my guess is at some point there was some mechanical damage, maybe, uh, maybe from the lawnmower or from a weed whip. Um, and just over time, it started to decline. The cambium has probably died underneath there, and then the bark is loosening and coming off. So you really, you can't wrap it. You can't treat it for anything. Um, I did notice that the tree also needed some pruning, which is true of a lot of silver maples. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of, looks like double trunks and triple trunks even in there, so there could be some issues down the road. Um, this is not a good situation, uh, but there really isn't anything you can do but wait and see, or um, you know, the tree could live for a while and then die in say 10 years, so if you removed it now and replaced it in 10 years, you'd have a nice tree. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't know where this view, oh, we do, red cloud. This happened over the winter. Uh, he's wondering, is this a deer rub? So we can see it from the distance there, and that's what we see, and he's wondering, uh, will it grow out of it? It is a, it is a young oak. Okay, yeah, it, it could be deer rub. Um, it does kind of have a distinct <coughs> shape to it, so mm -hmm. they are susceptible to some cankers uh, if 
Kyle was here, I would ask him. Um, so maybe maybe we'd want him to take a look at this picture, um, although there's not much you can do about cankers. So if it's deer rub, though, uh, you don't want to treat it with anything. We don't use pruning paints. We don't use wound dressings on there. You don't want to wrap it. Um, a young tree, if it's you know otherwise growing well and it has good growth on the ends of the branches, that's an indication it's healthy and it should... Uh, it defense, it's natural defenses should take care of that and with time it'll heal and not heal, seal, get wound, wound tissue growing over that uh, wound. All right, we have uh, a little less than a minute, Jody, and we have a, a viewer who has kitchen ants oh. not behaving like any other ant. Uh, they can't trace the path, they've tried ant killer, they've scrubbed down the countertops, they wonder how can they get rid of these little ants. They need to find out where they're coming from, but if they, have they, <coughs> did they try any baits? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, I'd have to find out what kind of ant it is, so you can send me, uh, send us a, a picture. You did send pictures, they were not real clear. Yeah, they're pretty hard yeah, to, they're hard to take, pictures take care of. Um, did you smash it and sniff it by any chance? <laughs> yes. No. You, well, you can find out if it's an odorous house ant if you smash it and sniff it. Mm. And that would still be a sugar bait. But I mean, some ants are gonna prefer to eat different things. And so you're just gonna have to keep feeding them. And if you feed them and not smash them because they need to take it back to their colony, that's another kind of clue. But I, I have heard a lot of stories of, about these kitchen ants. I just need to identify exactly what it is so we can feed them exactly what they want. But for the Shadron viewer, I wanted to say neem oil. How about we can try neem oil? Perfect. All right, thanks, Jody.